Good morning. Well, this is my second service here, and I can tell you, this is a jolly church. I, I like the spirit of life that's here. Very vital and exciting. This is, this is a, a fun church, a good church, and I, uh, I sense uh, the presence is here when you walk in. You, you just love that. There's so many churches that are just hanging on with their fingernails, and it's so wonderful to come to the church with vision and hope and leadership, and uh, this exciting young pastoral couple. Aren't you blessed to have them? Praise God. Well, we're, we're also delighted to be here. This is my associate, Ronnie Brandon, who's on the front row. And uh, we are going to be... I, ha- I want to get into the message pretty quickly, but I want to give you an infomercial first on, on uh, books that are available as you go into the lobby. Uh, Ronnie will be there with some volunteers here from the church to um, deprive you of your money. I mean, to make sure that you have these books Uh, there are four titles Um, I have written 19 books but we will not inflict all 19 on you they they brought four instead and they are here Uh, this book is called 21 seconds to change your world and it's about the connection between the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm Um, it is interesting to me that those two great devotional classics, the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm, were written by two men who were born in the same small village a thousand years apart. And now the 23rd Psalm is the preeminent devotional classic in Judaism and the Lord's Prayer in Christianity. So I I think you'll find the book encouraging. It was a book that I wrote after I'd been through a very discouraging time in my life and brought me out of it. 21 seconds is about how long it takes to pray the Lord's Prayer. So, and unless you're in Alabama, it takes 45 seconds. And... Oh, we've unleashed the demon of competition. This book is called Courage to Be Healed. Um, I believe in physical healing we all do we're Pentecostals this church obviously does you talked about miracles that you've seen Uh, but this is about inner healing not physical healing the healing of damaged emotions nobody gets through life without some nicks and cuts and and they can leave greater wounds than people think Uh, the challenge with getting healed internally of of the psychological and emotional wounds is that they, we think the number one variable is faith, and it's not. It's courage. The courage to face the issue and the courage to go through what it takes to get healed. So I recommend that book to you. This is a, a brand new book called Of Kings and Prophets. It, it's about the Old Testament kings and the prophets who confronted them. That's the, the basis of the book. But actually, uh, the real story is about the the conflict between secular power and supernatural authority, the authority of God. So I hope that you'll enjoy that. And then this book is one of our biggest sellers ever. Uh, This is a book I wrote about four years ago called David the Great. It's the life and leadership of King David, and it has just been huge for us through the years. I'm very grateful for that. Um, the reason that this book is well one of the reasons the book has done so well is that we managed to tap into a, a reading market that a lot of Christian books can't really reach uh, any publisher, Christian book publishers will tell you many Christian books are written by women for women but uh, regardless of what some of you women think some men can read um, we started to put pictures in this one. We thought that would, we thought that would help. No, really, it's uh, women buy the book and they love it. But it, it also men bought this book and read it and they love it. It's it's a great it's a great look at the life and leadership of King David, the real King David. This is not your Sunday school version. Uh, David was a tough guy. He was a man's man. Men men uh, 
one lady bought 10 cases. And I, I said, ma'am, there's 36 in a case. I, I was happy to sell you 1,000. But why? She said her son was a master sergeant in the Army. And she sent him 360 books to hand out to troops. Troops, why wouldn't a soldier want to read about a soldier? One man bought uh, books for all the police in his town. I like to know the cops are reading Christian books, don't you? And uh, why wouldn't men want to read about David? He was, a, he was a tough guy. He's the kind of guy you want to take deer hunting. You might not, you might not want him to take your wife deer hunting. Um, <laughs> But we, we deal with that. We deal with that. Look, David, David had an affair and, and murdered the woman's husband. I mean, this. what I wanted to know was why could a man do that and still be called a man after God's own heart? How does that, how does that work? That's what I wanted out of the book, and I hope it will be useful to you. I, I'll tell you something funny. I didn't tell this to the people at the early service, but they didn't deserve it. Um, <laughs> This is only for the second service. I was working on this manuscript in Israel. I've been to Israel uh, 48 times. And um, this trip, I had stayed behind to do some geographical research. Uh, In the online world, if you make a mistake in a book, somebody will catch it. And uh, so I didn't want to say David had marched north if he was marching south. So I actually went to places. I went to the cave of Adullam. I went to different places. And then I was back in Tiberias working on the manuscript out by the Sea of Galilee, sitting right by the lake, editing the manuscript. I'd mark on it and slide the page. I looked up, and there was an Israeli lady standing there across the table. She said, are you an American? I said, yes. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm editing a book. She said, what about? I said, David. I'm in Israel speaking to an Israeli. I said, David. She said, David who? I said, well, King David from the Bible, King David. She got a horrible look on her face, and she stepped back like somebody had touched her with a cattle prod, and she said, why would you write a book about that bloody man? And she stormed off, and I thought, what a man. I mean, que hombre, what a man. 3,000 years after his death, he can still make a woman that angry? That's that's a man. (laughs) Those books are all there. And by the way, we have them all in Spanish. All four books are there. La Lingua Celestial. So they're there. I hope you will get that and enjoy it. And it probably doesn't matter to you to hear this. It's important to me to say it. I do not, nor have I ever taken one penny from any book I've ever sold. Hundreds of thousands of books we've sold worldwide. And it, all of it, I don't take anything for speaking here, honorary love offerings, anything like that. I'm on a salary as the executive director of the NICL. And everything else, all ministry money, goes to support our girls' homes in Africa and Thailand. Pastor, do you have all four of these books? Now you do. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Love you. Thank you. I love this guy. If you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn to the book of Isaiah, the sixth chapter. I am. Uh, I was, I was raised in an unusual family. Um, I see a lot of young people here. I think the older you get, you'll realize how really weird your family was. Um, but my family was odd in this sense. Uh, neither of my parents were formally educated. My mother is a ninth grade dropout. My dad never finished school. But they were both extremely bright. Uh, my mother's magnificently well read my father could speak two languages Uh, my mother never finished the ninth grade but she believed if one could read one could learn anything and she taught us words words were important to my mother and they became important to me what words actually mean the problem with words 
is that they shift in meaning inside the same language. And as culture shifts, the words shift faster. And as technology advances, culture shifts faster. So there are actually words that don't mean the same. We still use the word, but they don't mean the same thing anymore. I, I prophesy to you young guys over here that when you are my age, should Jesus tarry and you live so long, there are words that you will use, but they won't mean the same thing as they do to you now. It's such a youthful church, but is there anybody here old enough to remember when gay meant happy? Does anybody remember that? I want gay back. Yeah. Who, who stole gay? I, when I was a kid, gay had nothing to do with sexual orientation. It was about disposition. I go to a party. I come home. My mother would say, did you have a good time? I said, yes. Everybody there was gay. She wasn't worried. We were just happy. What, what about Christmas? What about the Christmas song? We sing it every year. Don we now our gay apparel? That doesn't mean Christmas in drag. It, it, it just means we're happy at the birth of Christ. I was preaching uh, some years ago in California, which is evidently where the English language will be destroyed. And I was speaking to a high school audience and a, a huge auditorium full of high school kids and I've never preached to such an enthusiastic audience. Almost from the word go, they were just with it. And afterward, I was speaking to some boys right down here at the front. And uh, this one boy came with me and said, Dr. Mark, you are one bad preacher. In my lifetime, bad has come to mean good. The second boy said, you're not just a bad preacher. He said, you're the baddest preacher I've ever heard. Baddest is not even a word in the English language. <laughs> the third boy said, you're not just bad. He said, you are one sick dude. <laughs> one can only imagine my level of personal affirmation. <laughs> the fourth boy was not content with these low altitude compliments. He said, you are not bad. You're not sick. He said, you are the OG of crunk. I have no clue. <laughs> I teach the NICL, the Leadership Institute. Some years ago, a young man graduated that now pastors a hip-hop church, whatever that is. So I called him, and I said, Tommy, what in the world does... Somebody told me I was the OG of Crunk. What does it mean? He said, oh, OG means original gangster. <laughs> so he said... I'm the original gangster of Crunk? He said, yes. I said, see, Tommy, that doesn't really help me. Uh -uh. I said, I want to know what it means. Oh, he said, I assumed you knew what Crunk meant. He did? I said, no, Tommy, actually, I haven't a clue what it means. He said, oh, it means you beat a Mac Daddy. I said, no, Tommy, what I'm after is along the lines of a, of a definition. He said, Dr. Mark, I'm trying. He said, it means you be off the chain. I just decided to leave it alone. Now, now here's a word that's in the text we're going to read today. It has not changed its meaning. But it is important. It's a small little word also. And it is hugely important. Also is a bridge word between two competing realities. This is good. Also, this is good. This happens. Also, that happens. Without also the meaning of the sentence gets changed. Now, it's critical to the passage I'm going to read. I'm going to read it from the King James Bible because it's, it's there. If you're following in a modern translation, you may see the word also is missing. But that changes the meaning of the text. 
so also is important. So when I, I was at the university, the kids used to ask me all the time, why do you always read from the King James Bible? You don't, you don't have to have a King James Bible to go to heaven. That's, one will be given you when you get there. <laughs> but why stand in that long, embarrassing line? Show up with your own. I'm, I'm just joking. So I'm going to read from King James. And I want you to feel free to follow me in whatever cheap communist imitation you've got. <laughs> I love this church. A lot of places where none of that is funny. All right. Isaiah chapter 6. This passage is the call report of the prophet Isaiah. A call report is exactly what it sounds like. It's when the prophet reports his call. Some are called from being farmers to being prophets. Isaiah was a priest who was called out of the office of priest and into the office of prophet. And this is, this is his report of how that happened. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. I think I'll read a little further this morning. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from off of the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Put your hands on your Bible, if you will, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you, even now, humbly, brush aside every barrier to communication with you. Linguistic, cultural, generational, rush in over the threshold of our souls and enter in by your might into the inner person of every listener. That when we leave here today, we will say to one another, surely the Lord has spoken unto us. In the mighty name, Jesus, the strong Son of God, Amen. Amen and amen. This passage, perhaps above any other passage in the book of Isaiah, gives me an, an identification with the great prophet himself. It's so very like us as humans. We don't think of ourselves as prophets and, and the people out of the Bible, but this is so like us. He has the most extravagant vision of God, the most powerful divine revelation of God perhaps ever afforded to a human being and he dates it with a contemporary political event in his own life and nation we're talking about a transcendent reality the vision of God seated upon his throne as the emperor of the universe but he sees fit to say let me tell you when this happened and what was going on in my own personal na and national history. In the year that King Uzziah died. We have that in our lives. We have that in history. Uh, as I say, this is a very young congregation. You won't remember some of the things that I, I remember talk about. But I remember when I was in the 10th grade. I have a 10th grader over here. Who's in the 10th grade? When I was your age, sport, I was sitting in Mrs. Kovacs civics class in Damascus, Maryland, and the loudspeaker crackled and the principal's voice came over and he said, let me have your attention. I have the sober responsibility to tell you that this afternoon in Dallas, Texas, President Kennedy was just shot dead. I'll never forget that moment. I don't know right where I was sitting. I remember where I was the year that Dr. King was murdered when he was shot off a balcony 
of a motel in this very state. I remember the year that King was assassinated. I remember the year of the Watts riots. I remember the year when 9-11 happened. And we, we learned that we had a target on our backs. There were cultures and countries that hated us and hated everything that we stood for and hated us with a lethal and murderous hatred. I remember when Columbine entered our functional vocabulary and we learned for the first time that our high schools, which we thought were places of education and safety, could become killing fields in a moment. Almost everyone in this room will remember the word, the year that we learned the word COVID for the first time. The year of the pandemic. We, we remember these things. There are also those things in our own personal lives. The year that we finally graduated from high school. I remember them. The year that we graduated from college. I, I spoke at, conducted dozens and dozens of graduations in my life. At high school and college and universities. You know what I found? The people that cheer the loudest had the greatest doubts at the beginning. The year that you got married. The year the first baby was born. The year the last one finally moved out and you got your life back. <laughs> the year that you, if you're a pastor, the year you took your first church. The year you got voted out. There are... <laughs> the year of these things rise up and claim the authority and power to name years in our lives. Now, what was going on with Isaiah for this particular issue, the year that King Uzziah, don't confuse the King Uzziah with the prophet Isaiah. So King Uzziah, you may remember from scripture, was a young and charismatic king when he came to the throne. The, the nation responded to his leadership. He began to expand the borders. They won militarily. They began to win economically. And the nation had a, a resurgence under Uzziah's leadership. Until at the peak of his career, in the arrogancy of his heart, he wasn't content just to be king. He wanted to insinuate himself into the priesthood. He went to the temple and tried to offer a priest, uh, offer a sacrifice, which the priests resisted, obviously. It's forbidden by the law. And they said, your majesty, don't do this. Don't do this. And they pushed him back. And he became so angry that God struck him in his face with leprosy. And the king lived the rest of his life and died with leprosy. Now we know leprosy is a viral disease that can be treated with medicine. But at that time, you have to remember that it was understood leprosy was an outward and physical sign of an inward and spiritual curse. The life was cursed that had leprosy. So imagine the shame and humiliation for the nation. If the king is cursed, maybe the nation is cursed. If the king who is the center of all political, military, and cultural reality, if he has leprosy, does the nation itself have leprosy? I've tried to come up with a modern corollary for it, something that would show you what it would feel like to them at that time. This may not be the best example, but it is an example I've been able to come up with. Imagine if someday some president of the United States goes on international television and announces that he's dying with AIDS, not from a medical mishap or a blood transfusion, but from his lifestyle. Imagine how humiliating that would be for us. That's what the nation was dealing with. Now, Uzziah has finally died. And Isaiah the priest is dealing with the riot of confusing and conflicting emotions that a death like that always causes. We have to deal with it at funerals and in the wake of deaths all the time, don't we, Pastor? Because Grandpa finally dies with Alzheimer's after a long and painful extracted battle. And the people that are left often feel a sense of relief. Thank God that's over. It's over for him. He was miserable. It's over. It was a drain on the whole family. Thank God it's over. The minute they become aware of that, then they suddenly feel guilty. 
They say, wait a minute, what's the matter with me? Am I glad my grandpa's dead? Then they begin to think, maybe things will get better. Maybe now things will get better. As soon as they begin to think that, another thought comes. Wait a minute. Grandpa was the patriarch of this whole family. He was the linchpin. Grandpa gone. Maybe things don't get better. Maybe things get worse. That's what, Uzziah, that's what Isaiah is dealing with. The king is dead. Thank God the leprosy thing. Thank God it's over. But if the maybe things will get better, but if the last king died with leprosy, how bad could it get? So he's going through all that in his mind, walking up and down in the temple at night, when all of a sudden, in the wide expanse of this, expanse of this massive temple, one of the wonders of the ancient world, suddenly there appears God as a king, the emperor of heaven, seated upon a throne, and the train, the robe of his garment flows down through the, the temple, the air of the temple in resplendent glory, a shimmering magnificence of a glorious king seated there on a throne. And around him, these six-winged creatures called seraphim, which, by the way, is the only place in the whole Bible that they're mentioned. And they're flying with six wings. They fly with two. They cover their face with two, and they cover their feet with two. What can it mean? Even angels, even angels. God is so holy that even the angels are afraid to look at him. And that even angels, we think of the angels as holy, but even angels are cover their feet in humility when they look at a righteous God. And the angels begin to cry out, holy, holy, holy. And the temple is shaken on its foundations and fills with smoke. This passage is often misquoted and misunderstood. I've heard many people say, when God spoke, the temple shook. But remember, at this point, God has not spoken. The angels speak and the temple shakes. Now think what that means. If when an angel speaks, the temple shakes on his foundations, what if God should speak? And they cry out, holy, holy, holy. And the power of that message cannot possibly have been wasted on Uzziah. What is he saying? Why is God appearing to, to Isaiah? Why, what is that message? Why is that message not wasted on Isaiah now becoming a prophet? Why? Don't you see what he's saying? God could have appeared to Isaiah in any form. God is God. He appeared to Moses as a burning bush, right? He could be a pillar of fire, a cloud of smoke. He could appear in any form he wants. Why does he appear that day at that moment in national history, why does he appear as a king seated upon his throne? Don't you see the message? He's saying to Isaiah, I know you're shaken because the king has died. But I'm showing you the king is alive. He says, I know you're worried. I know you're worried because the throne of Israel is empty. But I'm showing you the throne in heaven is occupied. He says, I know you were embarrassed and humiliated because the last king died with corruption and leprosy. But I'm showing you that the king of kings is holy, holy, holy. And we have a king who will never lie, never sin, never cheat, never corrupt, never take a bribe, never be unjust, and will never, ever, ever die. The king is on the throne. That message was so important and timely to Isaiah. And it is important and timely to us. That no matter what is going on in our life, no matter what's happening, that rises up and chooses the, seizes the authority to name a year in your life. God says, I'm still on the throne. I'm still on the throne. I'm still holy. And I'm still in control. Look. History is not happening to God. Do you think because we are shaken, 
That doesn't mean God is shaken. History's not surprising. Do you think for one moment that God picks up the New York Times every morning? To, Whoa, I wasn't expecting that. Now what do I do? Let me just assure you, first of all, if God's reading a newspaper, he isn't reading the New York Times. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> but regardless of that, God is not surprised by history. All of history, all of human history is unfolding in the palm of his hand. You remember in the book of Revelation, it's an important passage, the seven seals that are on the scroll. Remember that? And John weeps because he says, who can open those seals? Those seals are the unfolding epochs of human history. Until this seal opens, it can't move forward. When that one opens, it moves forward. Until all seven of those seals are broken, history can't be complete. And so John says, who is worthy? And the angel says, weep not. The lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus, he opens those. Those seals have to move forward for history to move forward. But those seals don't pop off at random like the buttons off a fat man's coat. Those seals only open because of the sovereign decree of Almighty God. History is not happening to God. God is the God above human history. He's the God of human history. And remember this, he is also God in human history. God is bigger than Vladimir Putin. God is bigger than communist China. And we need to remember this, God is bigger than the United States. God is bigger than history. That, do you see what that does? That gives us a peace about life that the rest of the world can't understand. They say to us, what, what makes you have peace? Don't you see what's going on? Don't you see the possibility of World War III in Europe? Don't you see the, what's happening with the Chinese military? Can't you see what's about to happen in Taiwan or Ukraine? Don't you see the, don't you see the stock market? It looks like the stock market's dying with leprosy. Don't you see what's going on? Don't you see what's happening? Cryptocurrencies collapsing. Don't you see the corruption? We don't lie to them. Listen, denial is not faith. So there's no place. It doesn't say that Isaiah says, oh, no, 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 no. The king is not really dead. He's just taking a long nap. No, he says, in the year that King Uzziah died. So we don't have to lie to people. They say, don't you see what's going on? We say, I see it. I see it. But I also see the Lord, and he is high and lifted up. It is that also where our faith rests. Our, our peace rests on that fulcrum of also. Yes, I live in the world. I see those things. But I also see the Lord, and he is high and lifted up. And that, that restores our peace. Look, I, I struggle with the news. Don't you? You ever come to that night where you just can't stand to turn it on? Every now and again, my wife will say, Bush, would you like to go in and watch the news? I say, not tonight, baby. I, I can't do it. Let's see if we can find a Three Stooges movie. Let's, they're doing the same stuff, and they're funnier. <laughs> Our peace rests on the reality that, yes, we're in the world. Yes, we see what's going on with our families. Yes, we see what's going on in economics or geopolitics. Yes, we see all that, but we also see the Lord. Not only does it restore our sense of peace, it restores our sense of depth perception. What Satan wants to do is to convince you that molehills are mountains and mountains are valleys. He wants to confuse you with the magnitude of events. The things that he says, oh, because you haven't seen, you haven't seen the second coming of Christ. You don't see that. That's nothing. That's nothing because it's out of sight. Look at this. This is huge. This is huge because you can see it. Because he's a liar and the father of all lies. I didn't, uh, I didn't grow up in a fun, exciting Pentecostal church like this. I, I, I grew up in boring Methodism. It was, it was, I don't know a better word. I try to think of a better word. Just tragically dead, boring little Methodist churches. And in those days, we didn't have children's church. 
Anybody here old enough to remember that? You went to church and you behaved yourself, especially if you were raised by Rosemary Rutland. <laughs> My little mother, five feet tall, she denied all laws of physics. I never understood. How long are these rows of pews here, these benches? 15 feet, something like that? My mother is five feet tall. How could she sit on one end and me misbehave on the other end and she could pinch me? I've never, I've never understood how that happened. So I learned to entertain myself in church. And there was hanging in the top of our church a big cut glass chandelier. And I learned that I could make my thumb bigger than the chandelier. It taught me, boredom taught me depth perception. So I'm going to show you. Are you ready? I want you to do it. Just humble yourself. Do this, okay? I want you to look at one of these screens on the side and close one eye. Now extend your right arm and raise your thumb if you can. And then slowly, slowly pull your thumb forward, not too fast, slowly closer and closer to your open eye. Now right against your eye. It's a miracle. <laughs> you made your thumb bigger than that screen. Now, Pastor, if you look out here one day in the middle of your sermon and everybody's, <laughs> I'm just saying. Now, brethren, that's exactly what Satan wants to do. That's exactly what Satan wants to do with the events of life. He wants to take something that's happening in Europe or happening in your household. And he wants to push it right up against your face till it blocks the light of heaven. And he says, there, see that? See how big it is? See how terrible it is? See that child is disappointing you? See that wayward relative? See that war in Europe? Do you see that? Never argue with your adversary. Tell him. Say, yes, I see it. I see it. But I also see the Lord. And he's high and lifted up. You tell him. Tell him. You're not going to block the light of the sun. You're not going to convince me that that which is as small as a thumb is bigger than the king, which is the king of glory. The third thing that happens is it restores our sense of humility. We, we may get to thinking we're pretty special. Till we walk into the presence of a king upon whom the angels fear to look. There used to be this uh, guy that did an interview show on TV. And he interviewed movie stars. I, I've watched it occasionally. I was interested to hear what this guy or that woman had to say about something. But he had a one stock question that he would ask. He would always ask this. When you get to heaven, is there something you want to ask God? Just a Get the conversation started. In the first place, when should have been replaced with the preposition if. But we'll go by that. When you get, when you get to heaven, is there a question you want to ask? These movie stars, usually arrogant agnostics, they would, they would have all these angry questions. Yes, I got some things I'm going to ask God. What about poverty? What about AIDS? What about war? as if we're going to hold God responsible for the tragedies that we create. Beyond that, listen to Dr. Mark. Trust me, when you get to heaven, you're not going to ask God anything. You're not, you're not going to ask God anything. In the first place, let's be honest with each other. When you step in and those gates close behind you and you realize you're in, you go, whew. You're going to realize you didn't have as much faith as you thought you had. <laughs> Beyond that, when you realize that you walk onto that golden boulevard that stretches all the way to the throne of glory and the throngs of heaven stretch in both sides and the music of the spheres is playing around you and the eyes in your glorified body are trying to adjust to the brilliance of a sunless sky and on the throne at the far end of the boulevard there sits God Almighty with the throne and the rainbows and, and all the thunder and lightning and the angels and archangels and God says in the voice of 10,000 waterfalls, any questions? 
you're going to say, I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> I got no questions. You know, we used to sing this song. When I was a kid, we used to sing this song. Anybody remember it? We'll understand it better by and by. I, I'm not sure. I don't think, we, I think we may never understand it. I just think it won't matter. It restores our sense of peace. It restores our sense of depth perception. It also restores our sense of humility. What, what did Isaiah say the moment he saw God in his holiness? Woe is me. For I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in a culture that's nasty. I, I asked my Jewish guide one time in Israel, what do you think of when you think of a man of unclean lips? And he said, well, the most unclean thing that I could think of would be swine's blood, pig's blood. So he said, the image that comes to my mind when I think of that is of me with pig's blood smeared across my face. And I look around at my nation and everybody has pig's blood on their face. He said, that's how horrifying that passage is. And then comes this angel, this seraph. It's a fascinating passage. It says he takes a live coal off of the altar with a set of tongs. Then he transfers it to his hand and flies with it in his hand. Now, isn't that interesting? If he can hold it in his hand, why didn't he just pick it up with his hand? If he can't hold it, why didn't he fly with it in the tongues? Don't you see why? The altar of God is so holy that not even an angel can run the risk of touching it with his hand. But the lips of sinful humanity are so fragile that God doesn't want to give them the cold touch of legalism. The angel comes closer and closer. Imagine that breathtaking moment. An angel with six wings flying close to you, coming with a live coal in his mouth. When he touches you, is it going to burn you? Is it going to kill you? It's coming closer and closer and closer. You catch it. <gasps> and it doesn't hurt you at all. It burns away the filth. And the angel says, this hath cleansed thine iniquity and purged away your sins. When we see the king of glory upon his throne and in his holiness, yes, we are filled with humility at our sin, but we are not crushed by it because he also brings the instrument of our redemption. Now, Satan doesn't want you to have that. He doesn't want you to have that. He also, he not only uses human events to block your eyes, he uses you to block your vision. He wants to remind you of everything you've ever done. Remember that depraved thought? Remember that wicked fantasy? Remember when you stole that? Remember when you lied? Remember, he'll remind you of them over and over and over again. Try to block it out. Don't argue with him. Never argue with the devil. Say to him, yes, I remember it. I did it all. But you're not God. I did some things you don't know about. He said, don't you see how wicked you were? Don't see how sinful you were? You say, yes, I see it. But I also see the Lord, and he's high and lifted up. He is my redeemer and my king. He purges my iniquity. He cleanses my sin. Well, you've been so patient. Let me bring this to a conclusion. See if we can land this plane. Many, many years ago, I'm, I'm 75 now, but when I was in my early 20s, right at the um, end of the Civil War, I remember. <laughs> it's rude to laugh at a guest preacher. It's... I was uh, working on my freshman year on my master's degree, and I was assigned to do uh, a, week, a week, a month or so at a, at a nursing home for, uh, owned by the Presbyterian Church in Atlanta. There, I met a retired Presbyterian missionary. Think now, that was 50 years ago, 
and he was in his 90s then. So think how long ago he had gone to the mission field. In those days, you didn't hop on a jet and go to Africa for a two-week mission trip. In those days, you went to the mission field to be there, to live there, bury your family there, and die there. He had done all of that except die. Finally, in his 90s, his denomination had pulled him out, brought him back to stay in this home for superannuated Presbyterians, and he was going to be there until he died. And I just fell in love with the old guy. We were the odd couple. I was 22. He was in his 90s. And I, I didn't minister to him. He just told me stories. And one story I'll never forget. He said that somehow he had gotten a fantasy in his mind of someday seeing Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world. He said, I don't even know where I got that idea. I just thought I want to someday see Mount Everest. But there was no hope. He was a poor missionary in Southeast Asia. There was no chance he was ever going to get to go to Nepal and see Mount Everest. So finally, he got invited to speak, all expense paid, at a mission convention in Germany. And he had saved a little money, and his wife said, do it. So he flew an excursion to go see the mountain. But he told me the day his plane landed that the entire subcontinent had been engulfed in an impenetrable fog bank. He said the day his plane landed, he couldn't even see the terminal. He was so discouraged. But he got off and went through customs and found the guide with his sign. And he said to the guide, let's forget it. I'll just wait here and catch the next plane on to Munich. The guide said, it's bigger than you think. Come with me. It's bigger than you think. He said he went. He followed the guide. But he said he murmured and complained the whole way. Does that sound familiar to anybody but me? And he said that every time he complained and murmured about how the trip was going, the guide would say the same thing. It's bigger than you think. He said he went on a train and then got off and went on a Land Rover and then got off of the Land Rover and walked. I don't remember all the details, but there was some viewing platform or something where he could get the perfect vista of the great mountain. He said at the last, the guide was leading him up the trail, and he said the fog was so thick he couldn't see his own feet. He was holding the guide's coattail and murmuring, let's go back, this is stupid, he said. I can't even see. And he said the guide just kept saying, it's bigger than you think. Finally, the guide engineered him out onto the platform or whatever it was, and he said, now, look. And he said he gazed through the soup of that fog and he thought against the distant horizon he could just make out one mountain a little taller than the others and he said there I think I see it and he said that guide laughed and came around behind him and took hold of his head and said not down there he said look up there that is actually one of the sweetest ministries of the Holy Ghost. Whether it is in the face of geopolitical disaster, if we wake up in the morning with Chinese tanks in our driveways, or at the grave of a loved one, he comes behind us with feathered fingers and lifts our eyes aloft. And he says, not down there, my child. Look up there. Well, praise God in the house. Go on and magnify the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Praise His holy name. He's holy. He's holy. He's holy. He's holy. He's holy. Will you bow your heads just for a moment? Heavenly Father, I pray that you will dispel our fears. Quiet us internally, O God. Sanctify us in every way. And remind us that you are holy, holy holy. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and God bless this precious church.